on today's World Insight. The opening ceremony officially opens the 2022 Winter Olympics. Can these games leave a lasting legacy? And an exclusive with the Director General of the World Intellectual Property Organization. How can IP protection support the sports industry? Um, in these last two years, even though there have been a lot of disruptions to the economy, IP and innovation remain very resilient parts of the economy for many countries, for China's economy, for the global economy. Here is our host, Tian Wei. Hello and welcome to World Insight with me, Tian Wei. The program is coming to you live from Beijing. The countdown fireworks and an Olympic torch relay all ignited the Beijing 2022 Winter Olympic Games opening ceremony. The event took place on Friday night at the National Stadium in Beijing, also known as the Bird's Nest, the same venue that kicked off the 2008 Summer Games 14 years ago. Beijing has become the first city to host both the Summer and the Winter Olympics. Around 2,900 athletes will compete in 109 events this February. The organizers have vowed to deliver simple, safe and splendid games for the world. And the opening ceremony performances showcase the passion of sports from the people in China and also the passion to host the games. The opening ceremony was divided into 15 segments, including the Parade of Nations and the lighting of the Olympic snowflake. Chinese President Xi Jinping attended the ceremony and declared the games open. And the International Olympic Committee President Thomas Bach expressed his gratitude towards China for making these Winter Games happen amid the pandemic. For more on the 2022 Beijing Winter Olympics, we are joined in the studio by Paul Dong, co-founder of the EI Asia. Also in Shanghai, Miguel Galacci, the former Undersecretary of Italian Ministry of Economic Development. It's wonderful to have both of you gentlemen joining us uh, right now. First of all, Happy Lunar New Year to both of you. And certainly, this is a very special moment. Uh, the spring starts and the Winter Olympics for the 2022 starts, Paul. Yeah, Li Chun, or uh, I would rather call it the advent to, to spring. Uh, it's not quite uh, really spring here. Yes, it's still very deep in winter, but on the lunar calendar, it is indeed called uh, spring. And, uh, but more significantly, the, the opening ceremony. Tian Wei uh, just reminds me of 13 and a half years ago when we were together for the Beijing 2008 Summer Games opening ceremony. It reminds us so much, and we're so proud mm. that both the Bird's Nest as, a, as well as Beijing City yeah. can be the very first in the world, in the history of the Olympic Games, to ever witness, stage, and participate in both the Summer and Winter Games. For the past the decades, of course, uh, many in China have witnessed already and also experienced the excitement of uh, winter and summer Olympic Games elsewhere in the world. But still, this time, very excited. A lot of people have been expressing their passions online. Uh, and Miguel, you are in Shanghai, and you were watching the opening ceremony as well. Tell me more about your thoughts. Uh, it was very, uh, like you mentioned, uh, uh, very, very good, because uh, uh, we I, I was also at the opening ceremony in uh, Beijing in 2008, uh, and of course there are some differences, but the thing that I find in common, and this is really a little bit uh, general to the whole of China, uh, there's always the world together. Uh, this time was uh, Yi Xiang Wei Lai, so together for a shared future, and at the time in 2008 was uh, um, one world, one dream. So I think uh, it is uh, part of the overall uh, spirit uh, of both the Olympics and what China as a country, especially in this time of uh, mm. tensions uh, and anxiety around the world, uh, to deliver the message of friendship and peace amongst the people of the world. And I think uh, this is really 
the uh, main objective uh, of uh, these games, in addition, right. of course, uh, to, to the sport. And of course, there's a uniqueness of the Chinese culture. Earlier, we see in our footage uh, some photos of the opening ceremony. It was trying to depict about the lunar calendars in China, the 24 most important moments according to the calendar, and of course, the spring starts according to the lunar calendar. Look at that green. And there we go. The Olympic five rings rises uh, with the special effects and very much excitement among the crowd. And by the way, there is a huge crowd in the opening ceremony. People were there uh, in national dignitaries as well as uh, many uh, from around China coming to the national stadium. Uh, and these delegations, uh, you know, China delegation, those from the United States, Canada, Switzerland, uh, and also those coming from uh, countries that are not necessarily uh, has been celebrating long traditional winter sports, yet they still manage to send their delegates, big or small, to the 2022 Beijing Olympic Games. So that is the togetherness that we are talking about here, isn't it, Paul? Yes, exactly. And I also noticed this thing that during the, uh, the gala performance, that uh, when we had all the plates demonstrating the, uh, the slogans of the Olympic spirit, uh, faster, higher, and stronger, and we have an even bigger or more conspicuous together mm -hmm. uh, right in front of the uh, television view that people, that we, we are paying more attention to, to together now, of course, from Tokyo and to Beijing yeah. now. And this also demonstrated in the, the basic theme of uh, Zhang Yimou's directed uh, performance or spectacle, if you like, that uh, we uh, are the theme, main theme of this yeah. performance, and we means together. I remember very clearly, as long as the opening ceremony starts, people's attention is not going to be about politics, it's not going to be about high-profile uh, dignitaries, uh, uh, always. It's going to be about the sports. It's going to be about the athletes. Uh, and Miguel, I know even though you're in China, you're also celebrating for your national team, for example, the team of Italy. At, 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 how do you see the prospect? Well, Italy has a very strong uh, tradition, for example, in alpine skiing, so we expect uh, some medals there. Uh, we also hosted the Winter Olympics a few uh, years back in uh, Turin. Yeah. And the tradition of skiing and uh, generally a winter sport is uh, very strong, including skating. And so we do expect also positive results on the sport front. And uh, you are right, Tian Wei, this is now where we shift from uh, politics uh, into uh, games. Uh, and it is also through these victories uh, and the game, and doesn't really matter in the spirit of Olympic who wins, uh, who loses. Because at the bottom of all these events mm. is young people who've been trained for years, for years or even longer. They just come here yeah. to enjoy uh, sports. Okay. And we do hope that peace comes from the bottom. What about Team China? I know, uh, Paul, that uh, China has been preparing for this for years and certainly participating in almost every category, every sport that is on the list for the 2022 Winter Olympic Games. China has already achieved that goal uh, even before any competition begin. Uh, China promised to have at least one athlete to participate in all of the seven sports included in this Olympics and all of the 15 disciplines under those seven sports and China has already achieved that. And now China will try to achieve as much as possible in the 109 medal events, not in all of them, but there are many Chinese athletes in this. Mm. This has been achieved within a few years. This is remarkable and, uh, and amazing. Mm. And I think although the Chinese leadership and the government try to tone down expectations in medals this time around, uh, mm. uh, stressing that uh, you know, safety uh, and simplicity uh, and, and everything else, uh, participation, involvement, and together union, and not necessarily a lot of medals, but I think the, the general public right. from the Chinese population will still have a lot Wh of which interest. Which category are you looking at? Which category? Uh, the discipline. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
I think it's a learning process because most learning of these learning appeal for us, please for for everybody, including myself, because winter sports compared to those summer sports are still relatively so which, new. So which categories? Yeah, yeah we yeah. I, I'm I'm interested in everything, including luge, skeleton, <laughs> and bobsleigh, and also those biathlon events. All right. And a lot of skiing events instead of uh, skating because we are relatively more familiar with skating, figure skating, or right. short track ski skating. Of course, it's going to be very competitive because uh, there are a lot of extraordinary athletes coming from all over the world participating. Uh, Miguel, what about you? Which categories are you looking at? I tell you, I'm looking at two maybe opposites. One is uh, uh, curling, and the other one is uh, figure skating. Uh, maybe for two different reasons. Figure skating tends to be, let's say, a little bit more romantic. Mm. Uh, it brings memory back of early tales uh, uh, with the beautiful athletes dancing in, in, on ice. Uh, and curling, uh, um, as, as an engineer, it's mm. uh, very technical because we see the, the, the circles bounce, the speed, the, the, the frictions with the ice. Uh, so for, for both, for, for opposite reasons, uh, I, yeah. I, I enjoy watching those two, really. The beauty of winter sports, so once you experience it, you will have a very deep impression and certainly be able to appreciate them much more. Every winter sports has its tradition, and that is why at uh, this time with China, Beijing hosting the 2022 uh, Winter Games, uh, about 300 million people are expected to be on the ice and snow, meaning they're going to do some kind of uh, winter sports, uh, me included, by the way. I also tried several of them. A little bit clumsy, but I managed to do that. I really wonder, you know, what does that mean for all of us? You know, uh, when it comes to winter sports, the IOC certainly, there we go, that's my photo on the snow. <laughs> and what does that mean though? I mean, when 300 million people from China on the snow, on the ice, uh, what does that mean for the winter sports, uh, Paul? Well, it means a tremendous, a dramatic change to the entire landscape of international winter sports. Mm. That's why the IOC has been so excited about this opportunity, working together with China, with Beijing, to, uh, to finally have this delivered, yeah. uh, despite all the uh, challenges, including the pandemic. Because uh, what does 300 million mean? Currently, the world, before China joined the crowd, there are no more than 100 million people practicing winter sports in total in the entire world. And then, with China promising 300 million more, even if uh, maybe half of them are less loyal and you need to try even harder to, to, to retain them and, and try to yeah. make them to, to be loyal and come back to the sports. But a hun several hundred million people would sound like crazy for the existing winter sports world. <laughs> well, we are almost wrapping up today's uh, uh, discussion about the Winter Olympic Games, but I really want to ask you, and you know, today compared to 2008, a lot of things are different. So what does that mean for China to host this game, the city of Beijing? What does that mean for the world to be able to get up close to a city in China and to the people in China, even though we have the challenge of the pandemic? Uh, Miguel. Well, I think this is really one of the key success metrics uh, to show that uh, the world can go back to normality. China is implementing some measures, some may be strict, some may be less strict, to test how the world can look like uh, in the next uh, few months. And I know it will uh, be a successful because I know China is taking all that it needs to do to make sure that both athletes have uh, an enjoyable time within safety. The follow-up of this, uh, I, you know, I, as a, an Italian, remember the next Olympics will be in uh, Milan, in yes. Italy. So this is for us a very important. Uh, we're talking about the development of winter sports. Uh, we are also in Italy going to open up to tourism very soon. So we do hope that Chinese tourists, they learn to ski here in China, <laughs> they enjoy the games, they get excited, mm. and hopefully we will have an exchange of people from Italy and China to uh, visit each other now that the world hopefully in the next few months will open up uh, again. So this is really the bet that we are trying to do. And Italy is, of course, open for Chinese skiers in our also beautiful Alps. Faster, higher, stronger, together. 
The slogan and the motto of the Olympic Games for this time is already giving us a lot of uh, encouraging spirit, shall we say it that way. Let's wish the Games great success. Thank you so much, Mika Galachi, Paul Dong, for joining us. All Thank the best. You. This is World Insight with me, Tian Wei. Coming up, an exclusive interview with the Director General of the World Intellectual Property Organization. How does intellectual property protection support the sports industry and the Olympic movement? Answers next. Welcome back. This is World Insight with me, Tian Wei. The 2022 Winter Olympics is abuzz with excitement. Besides coaches and athletes, some 20 foreign heads of state, members of royal families and heads of international organizations are attending the event. Darren Tang, the Director General of the World Intellectual Property Organization, is among the dignitaries who arrived on Thursday and spoke with me for an exclusive interview. The intellectual property system and trademarks in particular play a pivotal role in safeguarding the symbolism of the Olympic Games. Mr. Tang explains the link between sports and intellectual property protection, and he also discusses his busy plans in the city of Beijing. Mr. Director General, what a pleasure to see you. Thank you so much for taking your time out of your busy schedule during your Beijing stay. It's a pleasure to be on your program and an honor to be with uh, everyone in Beijing for the opening ceremony of the Winter Olympics. And also happy the Year of the Tiger to you and all your colleagues at uh, WIPO. Thank you very much. Also on the wish uh, of you, Xin Zun Kuai Le, Hu Nian Ji Li. So, Mr. Director General, the Olympic Games is already underway. How would you understand the relationship between intellectual property right protection and sports? Well, the connection actually goes back quite a long way. I don't know many of your viewers know this, but there's a WIPO treaty called the Nairobi Treaty that specifically protects the famous five ring symbol of the Olympics. And then this protection allows us to, uh, allows IOC to also use it to find partners. And as over the next few days, as we watch these amazing sportsmen and sportswomen compete in all these games. Uh, when we watch these broadcasts live, uh, IP protects these, the underlying content of these live broadcasts and allows for the commercialization of these uh, broadcast rights. And in fact, it's become a very important revenue source for many international sporting organizations. For the IOC, the Olympic uh, broadcast rights is almost 70% of their revenue. Uh, and of course, if you think about IP and sports, many of the sports brands have become famous brands around the world, for example, Leaning, or, or famous football clubs like Guangzhou, Hengda, or Manchester United. These are all very famous brands. And technology now has become quite an important part in sport as well. Uh, for example, when you watch the Olympic Games or Olympic competitions, you will see a lot of technology used to decide whether the ball is in and out of the court. So technology, brands, and broadcast rights, they all combine to form a very important part of, of, uh, of sports rights, and IP is part of that. Uh, and in fact, I think just a few years ago, these sports rights uh, have amounted to about 50 billion US dollars. And in a few years' time, right, it's predicted that they'll amount to 85 billion US dollars. So we hope that IP rights can, can support international sporting organizations, uh, allow them to earn revenue, and, and, in, and in return, right, support the sportsmen and sportswomen and support these sporting activities. With uh, the VIPO's important role for the Olympic movement, I'm sure you're going to be a very busy person during your trip here in Beijing for the 2022 Olympic Games. So how are you planning your days? Well, I'll be meeting with, of course, uh, many different important uh, dignitaries, uh, both in China as well as international dignitaries. Uh, I'll also be enjoying the opening ceremony of the Olympics. I'm looking forward to that. The last time I was in Beijing was about four or five years ago in very different circumstances. And then, of course, I'll be working, I'll be looking forward to celebrating the Olympic spirit uh, with, with everyone. Uh, this is really a truly a special occasion uh, that we can host the Games even in the midst of such difficult challenges. Uh, and of course, enjoying the nice winter end in Beijing uh, as uh, coming from Geneva, of course, it's also cold over there. 
uh, but it's very special to have this atmosphere and, and the spirit of Chinese New Year as well. Mr. Director General, the UN Secretary General earlier suggested that we are experiencing together uh, the most challenging time since the Second World War. So how is that having an impact on your work? How do you see your role of WIPO? Well, indeed, the, the pandemic has disrupted lives and livelihoods around the world. So the first thing we need to do is to help member states overcome the pandemic. And, this, and so WIPO has put together a package of COVID-19 of support to help member states build the capabilities and technology transfer and other technical skills, right, so that they can absorb the technologies and use the technologies to help overcome the pandemic. We also have com work, uh, cooperated with the World Trade Organization and the World Health Organization in a trilateral cooperation, three agencies, where we will bring our expertise in IP, trade and health together because overcoming the pandemic is not just, uh, it's not just about one factor, but many factors working well together. So we can, as you can see, we are trying to work by ourselves as well as with other UN agencies, other international organizations, other international organizations, to help member states overcome the pandemic. But at the same time, I think there's also a lot of opportunities that have arisen. We find that um, in these last two years, even though there have been a lot of disruptions to the economy, IP and innovation remain very resilient parts of the economy for many countries, for China's economy, for the global economy. Uh, for example, even in 2020, uh, during the height of the pandemic, uh, global research and development expenditure uh, remained uh, grew. Uh, global venture capital deals grew as well. And last year, right, IP filings grew. And in fact, uh, trademark filings increased by 14%, which is very high. And the reason for that is that a lot of businesses are using this pandemic as an opportunity to transform their business, to go online, to find new avenues using virtual and e-commerce avenues to, to grow their business. And I think here's something where we want to help these businesses to take use of these opportunities. And so WIPO's focus for the next few years will be on helping small and medium enterprises, entrepreneurs, innovators, uh, researchers, right, to use the IP system to transform their ideas into something that is tangible, to bring their ideas to the market. And we hope that that's something that we can help, not just at the company level, but even at the global level, uh, help member states to use IP as a very powerful tool to create jobs for business growth, attract investments, grow their economy and, and create vibrant societies. Uh, but at the same time, you see uh, that the world is uh, very much going to be driven by innovation, Mr. Director General. The developing countries, emerging economies, particularly the developed ones and the least developed ones, how would they be able to catch up with the trends? I think, in fact, what, what we are seeing over the last few decades is a very interesting trend. Innovation is no longer just coming from developed countries. Uh, but increasingly it's being, being driven right, as a global phenomenon. Let me just give you some examples. Uh, 20 years ago, four out of 10 IP applications came from Asia. Last year, seven out of 10 IP applications came from Asia, not just from Northeast Asia, uh, China, Japan, and Korea, uh, Republic of Korea, but also from Southeast Asia, uh, from India, from South Asia, and increasingly from Central Asia. And of course, beyond Asia, in Africa, in Latin America, uh, IP filings and, and innovation activities are, are growing at, at, at a very strong pace. So I think what's happening is that, that more and more countries are using IP and innovation to grow their economies because they're beginning to realize that IP is a very powerful catalyst for jobs, for business growth, for economic development, and for social vibrancy. And we want to help them to, to achieve that. So uh, let me give you one example. Just last year, uh, the, in Mexico, there's a state called Oaxaca. And the state of Oaxaca is a community called San Pedro de Cayanos. They produce silk, which of course came from China, but now it's become a worldwide uh, product. And the community in, in, in Oaxaca and Mexico have asked us for help to see how they can use this opportunity to, to use IP to promote their silk, promote their unique way of creating silk, uh, these are indigenous communities. So we are going down to the ground to help least developed countries and developing countries to use IP in a very practical way at the grassroots level, right? To transform ideas into the market and to help entrepreneurs, innovators, creators at the ground level, at the grassroots level, to use IP to, to earn a living and to, and, to, and to take the ideas to the market. That is certainly a great idea, Mr. Director General. You talk about some of the latest reports put out by WIPO. 
Some of those reports I was reading earlier are suggesting that Asia has become such a birthplace of intellectual property uh, globally. It is actually leading on the list. How do you see the current situation and where is Asia? Since you yourself is originally coming from Asia as well, how do you see the Asian culture with the idea of innovation? I, I strongly believe that innovation belongs to everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, we, as, we as a human species, we are by nature innovative and creative. And innovations that have contributed to world culture have come from every part of the world. So I think that when, when the IP system becomes globalized, and I think that's what's happening now, increasingly IP growth is being driven by many different engines and Asia has emerged as a major engine. I think the world will be a better place for it because good ideas can come from anywhere. And my job as the, as the head of the UN agency in charge of IP is to help innovators from anywhere in the world use IP to take their ideas to the market and make a positive contribution to the world. Uh, and in terms of, of, of growth in Asia, I think, you know, coming from Asia, of course, I think it's very interesting. Coming from Southeast Asia, from Singapore, we've had a chance to see this amazing growth. Southeast Asia has emerged as a major place for unicorns, for, for technology, uh, for smart cities, for, 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 for digitalization. But the same story is being played out all over the world in Africa and Latin America. So I think what I, what I think will happen is that these trends will continue because the, 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 the beauty of innovation is that it can come from anywhere. And so we hope that these trends will continue and then we hope that we will harness all these trends for the betterment of mankind. Because in the end, the global challenges that we face, climate change, inequities, the pandemic, right, can only be solved when we tap on good ideas from anywhere in the world. So that's, we hope that that will continue and we hope that we can support that global growth in IP. Mm. Thank you so much, Mr. Director General. What a pleasure talking to you. I hope you have a great day in Beijing during the Winter Olympics. Darren Tang, head of the WIPO, joining the many international dignitaries in Beijing for the 2022 Winter Olympics. That's all the time we have for today, a very special program that we have for the Winter Olympic Games. Uh, if you'd like to know more, search World Insight, check out our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter and Facebook. I'm Tian Wei. On behalf of my team, thanks for being with us. Bye for now.